Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast, brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and Transrelational Healing, as well as littleshaman.org, that's me the little shaman. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that the two-day virtual narcissistic abuse recovery clinic is being held June 29th and 30th, so if you are interested in attending, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. We'll be covering things such as how to create boundaries, how to recognize and address trauma bonds, getting to know yourself after abuse, regaining your sense of agency, and much more. So hope to see you there. Today I wanted to talk to you about something that lots of people might not realize because it can seem contrary to how so many narcissists present themselves. It's probably actually one of the biggest sources of your conflicts with narcissists and you might not even know it because it can be hard to see, especially at first. Narcissists are fragile. By fragile in this context, we mean easily hurt, damaged, or broken. The definition flimsy and insubstantial also applies to narcissists in the sense of their identity. Anyone who has dealt with a narcissist can attest to how fragile they are, regardless of how they react, whether it's with cold silence or a white hot explosion or anything else in between. You can see it if you look. Everything hurts their feelings. Everything triggers them. Everything insults them. Everything offends them. Though they commonly weaponize, they're constantly offended or constantly hurt feelings in order to manipulate, harm, and bully other people, the hurt and offended feelings themselves do seem to be genuine in many situations in the sense that they actually do seem to be real. How these are expressed, or even if they are acknowledged, might vary, but the feelings themselves seem legit. This is a big part of why narcissists are so defensive. As we discussed in the episode of the show entitled Narcissists are Cowards, narcissistic personalities harbor deep and ever-present fear. A large amount of that ever-present fear has to do with this core fragility. Imagine if you had a very delicate blown glass sculpture sitting on an end table in your living room. You would be hyper aware of any threat or even any movement near that sculpture for fear that it's going to get damaged or that it will be broken somehow. Now imagine that that sculpture was something that your life and your well-being depended upon. You would be extremely hypervigilant about anything happening even roughly approximately in the same area as the sculpture, let alone anything that actually touched it. That sculpture is the narcissist's ego. It's their feelings, their identity, their sense of reality, their narrative. Everything about them is very fragile, and they are almost delusionally defensive in order to make sure that nothing causes any damage to any of these things because that legitimately is a catastrophe for them. It can be hard for a person who has basic stability in these areas to understand, but for narcissists, damage to these things feels like an apocalypse, an apocalypse of the self, right? We can see that in their reactions to either real or perceived threats to these things, and in their paranoia that there will be threats or damage to these things. Because these fragile approximations are all narcissists really have in terms of identity, defenses, reality, narrative, or anything else, damage to these weak approximations doesn't just feel like an apocalypse of the self. In some ways, we could say that it actually is one. And because of that, along with their extremely immature, arrested emotional regulation abilities, they can't handle their reactions to that. They have no way to defend against this because these things are their defenses. Therefore, what we most often see is just a panicked attempt to reestablish them. What else is there to do? This is a person with the emotional maturity and regulation ability of a toddler. And it appears that whether they acknowledge the feelings or not, every feeling they have is very large, perhaps even disproportionate to the situation, the way that it is with small children. As we've discussed in other episodes of the show, there is every possibility that you are offending and hurting and insulting and upsetting and triggering narcissists in your life almost constantly without ever even realizing that. If you are around them long term, you can even start to feel when this happens, although a lot of times they won't admit it. Every minor annoyance is a catastrophe. Every small problem is the end of the world. Every perceived slight is an enormous and intentional insult. Every perceived offense is a terrible and purposeful crime against them. This level of emotional and psychological fragility makes dealing with narcissists extremely difficult. 
It's what results in people walking on eggshells or becoming afraid to ask questions or to even say anything to narcissists because it can be impossible to know what will upset them or what will anger them. And because they are so fragile and so raw emotionally, there's no such thing as minor upset or mild anger when it comes to narcissists. Even those that seem outwardly as if they don't care about anything have this going on on the inside. It's one of the core features of this personality. And even narcissists themselves often cannot explain why they are so upset or what has upset them. And many times they don't really seem to care. Because they're so ill-equipped to deal with emotions or discomfort in any way, they just want it to stop. And to that end, they insist that it's the other person's responsibility to do something about that. This is, again, very much like a small child. They don't know why they're upset or why they are so upset. They just know that they are, and you need to make that stop. That's one of the most clear indications of their fragility. Not just how easily they are damaged and wounded and affected by normal, basic, and small things, but how little ability they even have to acknowledge that that's happening. Whether they react to these feelings and emotions in a hot way with tantrums and explosions and hysterics or in a cold way with silences and avoidance and ghosting or by pretending they don't care at all, it's all the same. This person is so fragile, so easily wounded, and so unable to deal that they cannot tolerate taking any responsibility for anything, even their own feelings. But it's also more than that. The pathologically narcissistic personality is, in many ways, not a complete person. They have an unstable, fragmented identity. Different parts of their personality try to work together, but because the foundation for their personality is unstable, they generally cannot resolve themselves into a cooperative, cohesive, whole being. This is a huge part of what results in the Jekyll and Hyde presentation or expression of personality for which they are notorious. The parts of their personality are split off from each other to a degree and they don't work together in a normal or successful way, similar to what we see in disassociative identity disorder, what we used to call multiple personality disorder. Some statistics suggest that more than 75% of the people who would qualify for a cluster B personality disorder diagnosis also qualify for a diagnosis of disassociative identity disorder. That gives us indication of how unstable the personality structure and organization of pathologically narcissistic people really is. Because of this instability and the narcissist's complete lack of coping skills, they are often extremely fragile. As we've discussed in other episodes of the show, narcissists are generally pretty fearful people underneath everything. One of the things that they fear the most is reality, and their excessive fragility is one of the biggest reasons for that. Narcissists are so fragile that they're not able to confront the reality of who they are, how they are, what they are. Anything to do with the truth of themselves and their life in general is intolerable. And it's not just because they don't like it or they wish it wasn't true. They literally cannot deal with it. They can't cope with it. Because of the toxic shame that is at the core of the narcissistic personality organization, the idea or even the suggestion that they might not be something special or amazing or important or whatever the thing causes a tidal wave of shame that they have no way to combat or address because it impacts all of their defenses. Their lack of coping ability, coupled with the disproportionate size of the toxic shame, creates a situation that is extremely threatening to this personality. Life-threatening, to be exact. An apocalypse of the self, as we stated earlier. They simply cannot allow this to happen. So they create their own reality, and they manipulate, bully, or discard the people around them in an attempt to make that narrative a reality. If other people believe in it and behave as if it's true, then it is true. It becomes something that the narcissist can believe in as a narrative, as an identity, as a reality. The problem is, it's not. It's not reality. It's not real. But it's so important to their survival that even a slight brush with actuality can bring an extreme reaction as they scramble to hold their fractured fantasy and therefore their fractured identity together. The identity is dependent on the fantasy to a large degree because there really just isn't that much else there. If the fantasy is destroyed or it's exposed as false, the identity risks extreme damage, and so does everything else. Remember the blown glass sculpture from our earlier example. If this becomes damaged, the others become damaged as well. It's like a domino effect. 
The personality then, which is the expression of the identity, becomes severely unstable because the fantasy narrative is sort of the first and really the only defense that narcissists have. Once that fantasy narrative is damaged, the narcissist defenses become ineffective because most, if not all, of those are based on that narrative. This leads to what we sometimes call narcissistic collapse, and it's a very, very dangerous situation for narcissistic personalities that can result in decompensation, psychosis, even death. It's very serious. Without that fantasy, the narcissistic personality structure has no ability to regulate itself at all. As you can probably guess, this is something this person feels like they need to prevent at all costs. They might not understand the mechanics of how this works, it's probably safe to assume most of them don't, but they can feel the feelings associated with all of this and that's enough for them to know that they need to stop that at all costs. However, they have no reliable ability to do that and no real way to do it at all except for avoidance and denial. That is what the fantasy reality and false self and all their other maladaptive coping mechanisms are really about denial. As we discussed in the episode of the show entitled Narcissists and Denial, a Masterclass, it's all they really have and it doesn't work very well for them in the long run because things are what they are regardless of what anybody ever tries to pretend. Denial has no effect on reality whatsoever for anybody. This extreme level of denial is evidence of how fragile a narcissist's emotional and psychological makeup really are. They cannot even use a more sophisticated coping mechanism because that would require at least acknowledging the reality of the thing and they can't do that. They simply pretend that things are not true because they can't tolerate even the suggestion that they might be. Even just doing that is too threatening. The pathologically narcissistic personality is so fragile that anything outside of what they can tolerate knowing and dealing with, reality itself, in other words, is perceived as an aggression toward them, as threatening and damaging and aggressive, as dangerous. Fragility of this level makes interacting with this kind of person too hard. When someone is this easily offended, this easily hurt, this easily insulted, this easily triggered, this easily upset, it's not possible to reliably predict in any way how they're going to react to things or what will upset them, which means that these things can't be avoided, which means that communication and interaction are going to be spectacularly unsuccessful. This is especially true because not only are narcissists extremely fragile, but due to their fragility, they're paranoid, delusional, and they tend to have a gigantic negativity bias on top of their enormous perceptual blind spots. This means that things that seem safe and benign or even kind to say can be taken totally differently than they're intended, even in ways that make no sense. Narcissists have an impaired ability to reality test, which means they may very well believe that they see proof of their delusional conclusions and anyone attempting to tell them that it makes no sense is perceived as lying or trying to trick them somehow. Another part of the problem dealing with narcissists too is that they will project their fragility and massive feelings onto other people, especially when these things are perceived by the narcissist as negative. Projection is another form of denial and another example of their fragility in this case. They cannot handle the negative inner experiences, so they project them onto other people, stating that you are the one who's upset, or you are the one who's angry, or you are the one who is constantly bothered by everything that they do, even in situations where it's very, very clear that this is the opposite of what's happening. And you're sitting there like, okay, but I was literally just sitting here watching TV. You came in and started yelling at me. I don't even know why. I never even said one word to you. Why are you saying that I am the one who's angry? Why are you saying that I'm the one who's upset? For narcissists, to experience negative emotions seems to be seen as proof that something is wrong with them. In their way of looking at it, good people are always happy people. This is where the now debunked quote-unquote fact in the medical and academic communities came from that narcissists are happier than other people. Narcissists were asked if they were happy, and they reported yes more often than people who are not narcissists. We now know that you cannot rely on narcissists to self-report, as not only will they lie, but because they might not even really understand what's being asked, especially when it's about feelings or emotions, and especially when it's about their own feelings and emotions. Through other ways of measuring emotional reactions, we have now found that narcissists are not legitimately happier than other people. In fact, studies show that narcissists feel higher levels of stress and feel them more acutely than people who are not narcissists. That's not a surprise to anybody who has been around them. 
Most do indeed seem to be miserable people who cope with that by spreading the misery around. And that makes sense. If someone is this obviously fragile and this obviously afraid, how could they possibly be happy? How could they even know what happy is? Perhaps more important than that, though, more than the fact that they can't be relied on to self-report, is the fact that regardless of the reality of things, narcissists very often will choose whatever the quote-unquote right answer seems to be in any given situation. This means the answer that makes them seem normal, good, not bad, not wrong, this kind of thing. In other words, the answer that they think will support the image they're trying to project onto the situation. If someone asks you if you are happy and your life has been spent trying to make sure that you are seen as a good, worthwhile, valuable, not bad, not wrong person, it's not that hard to figure out what the quote unquote right answer should be. It would be yes, because yes, I'm happy. Why wouldn't I be? Ain't nothing wrong with me. Must be something wrong with you. I'm a good person. I have no bad feelings. Because of this, narcissists will very often not admit to any negative feelings at all. They don't seem able to tolerate even acknowledging that these feelings exist for them, let alone admitting that they're actually happening to them. It isn't just their own negative feelings that narcissists have issues with either. They can also become extremely triggered by either real or perceived negative emotions and affects in other people. These seem to upset, terrify, even enrage narcissists. They can become ridiculously triggered by things like very minor annoyance or vague disappointment in other people, making enormous problems out of things that are small problems or maybe not even problems at all. Narcissists also have extreme difficulty reading emotional states in other people. Studies have repeatedly shown that they cannot accurately read the facial expressions or body language of other people and that they routinely read hostility, anger, and other negative emotions into facial expressions when it is not there. This causes them to feel attacked and is another example of the extreme fragility that you're dealing with here. As an aside, people sometimes believe that narcissists can read other people's feelings because of their ability to manipulate. But the reality is, when we really look at the situation, what we more often see is that narcissists often quote unquote read negative emotions and odds being what they are, they just happen to be right sometimes. Like even a stopped clock is right twice a day. If you constantly accuse somebody of having negative emotions, sometimes you're gonna be right. That accounts for some of it, but the rest seems to be that Narcissists are not actually picking up on people's emotional states at all a lot of the time. What they appear to be doing instead is watching people's reactions. This is why they often get it wrong and it's also why not having any reactions that are observable generally frustrates and angers them. Without that to go off of, they don't know what to do. If they could truly read people's emotional states, that would not happen. This is a sad situation to many. For someone to be this frightened and fragile is a shame. However, it's pretty difficult to maintain sympathy for people who are so abusive and horrible because of that. Conversely, there are people who find it impossible to believe that any adult person could be this fragile and they view it all as manipulation and trickery on the narcissist's part. The reality, as is with most things, seems to be a little bit of both. Yes, narcissists are extremely fragile. They're very easily hurt, upset, insulted, offended, triggered, and angered. That's not really debatable. It's really not. However, they are also totally willing to use those feelings to guilt, trap, trick, or otherwise manipulate other people for any number of reasons. They're willing to perform emotions, both real and totally dramatized, for sympathy or to appear as victims as well. This is not debatable either. There can be other factors involved here as well, such as the masochistic streak that many narcissists have and the eagerness with which many of them jump at being offended, upset, insulted because of the physical and emotional arousal it creates in them, even though it feels bad. This unfortunately tends to feed into and reinforce the size and the extremity of their emotional reactions. A quote, drama addiction is a real thing. It's thought to be caused by emotional neglect of some kind. When humans are babies, if no one responds to their distress, they will legitimately die. Adults with overreactive or what we think of as drama-seeking behavior, attention-seeking behavior, seem to be sort of stuck in that mode of being for whatever reason, and this is part of why their emotions are so extreme and provoke such extreme reactions. They seem to still be having that infantile stress reaction of, if I'm not acknowledged, I will die. 
There are also adults who were conditioned into this behavior when they were very young by caregivers who routinely did not respond adequately to the distress unless or until it was very extreme. For example, if their caregiver was also a narcissist who would say things like, don't bother me unless you're bleeding. Well, that tells the child that their distress has to be enormous before anybody's going to care and people get stuck in that way of being. Many, many narcissists appear to fit into these categories. There's also the reality here that many narcissists use their legitimate pain and trauma as weapons against other people in order to justify punishing and hurting them. For example, the accusations and paranoid conclusions used to justify mistreating other people, such as in the horrific case of Sheila Labar, who accused the vulnerable and in some cases disabled men that she had romantic relationships with of being pet files of hurting her animals, of destroying her property, and many, many other things. When they would agree because they were either too afraid to deny it because she was extremely violent or because they were too developmentally challenged to really understand what was going on or defend themselves, she used this as justification to beat, torture, and kill them. Sheila was fixated on pedophiles due to her own trauma and would come to these like delusional conclusions that she absolutely could not be swayed from. She could not be talked out of them. Such as she insisted to one boyfriend that his mother must have done something to him when he was a child because the mother hugged him whenever they visited her. Sheila insisted that the hugging stop or they're never coming back. She even forced this man to confront his mother over her delusional belief that his mother had been inappropriate with him somehow as a child. After she convinced him of his own trauma, she then became convinced that he was a pedophile too and that he was hurting her animals. She forced him to write a letter admitting all of these things. Her horrific physical and psychological abuse of him was witnessed multiple times by people who worked on the farm who were also afraid of her. One day this man disappeared. He has never been found, although others have. This is a perfect example of how fragile narcissists can be and why this is so dangerous. That wasn't the sole reason for Sheila's behavior. Of course, this is clearly a violent, evil person, but it's definitely one of them. Sheila Labar weaponized her own trauma as a way to punish those who she forced into the role of quote-unquote bad guy, then reacted to her own fragility by becoming the one who held all the power. This made her no longer vulnerable in her perception. She's now the punisher, and this quiets the shame and the fear that being so fragile creates in this kind of personality. Unfortunately, this is something we see in many, many narcissistic adults. The constant restaging or recreation of situations situations where they felt victimized in an attempt to retroactively punish the victimizer or to otherwise create an outcome that enables them to feel less vulnerable and less victimized. Freud called this phenomenon repetition compulsion. And it doesn't just happen to narcissists, of course, but with narcissists, it is often very extreme and very, very toxic. For example, Sheila Labar perceives herself as an avenging angel saved from suicide to kill pedophiles. She has writings and journals and things going going back years that substantiate that belief that she really does think that. This is grandiose and self-aggrandizing to the extreme. In reality, she is just a sick, narcissistic who wants to hurt people because it makes her feel better since she feels that she was hurt, something that is unfortunately very typical of these personalities. Her attorney pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, by the way, and when she was found to be sane, she collapsed in her attorney's arms, sobbing in relief that the jury did not believe that she was crazy. She does not think there's anything wrong with her at all. She perceives her thinking, her decision-making, her behavior, her reasoning, all of it to be totally normal and rational. Not all narcissists go to the extremes that someone like Sheila Labar went to, of course, but if you've been dealing with very narcissistic people, it's likely that you recognize at least some of the behavior she's engaged in that was mentioned here. The fragility of narcissists is dangerous, largely due to their desire to combat that fragility by putting themselves in the power position, which all too often means position of the aggressor, of the attacker, of the abuser. Remember, being so fragile means feeling attacked and threatened essentially all the time. The only way to stop that feeling or to combat it is to become the constant aggressor yourself. They are standing in front of that blown glass sculpture ready to swing on and fight to the death anybody who even looks at it. The sculpture is unfortunately sitting in a high traffic area, which means the narcissist has to fight everybody all the time because the sculpture is so gigantic and taking up so much space people can't help but notice it. And then here we go, now it's on. 
if you're dealing with narcissists in any capacity, understand that this level of fragility makes any kind of relationship virtually impossible. It's like trying to play soccer with a glass orb, just not made for that. Their inherent dysfunction is able to keep them alive after a fashion and not much else. In some situations, it doesn't even do that very well. They're really legitimately not capable of much of anything outside of basic survival. Their brains are tasked with keeping them alive and getting what they need, not making them happy, not trusting anybody else, not making sure they can give or receive love, not considering other people, nothing. Now, everybody's brain works this way to a degree, but for pathologically narcissistic people, not only is it so much more dire and so much more extreme, there's often not much ability or even desire to do anything more. And how could there be when so much of their energy goes into just existing? They literally have to try to create all of their own stuff from nothing, convince other people that it's real so that they themselves can buy into it, then spend a huge amount of their energy and time protecting it so that it doesn't get damaged because it's just too hard to keep rebuilding it all the time. It's important to understand too that we should not mistake fragility for any kind of healthy vulnerability because these things are not the same. For narcissists, the word vulnerable translates to weak. Narcissists despise weakness and they absolutely fear and denounce it in themselves. For others, vulnerable in relationships usually means the ability to be open and honest, even if it's uncomfortable, to be trusting, even if it's scary. That is not what fragility is or how fragility works, especially in narcissists. Narcissists are not the only people who can be fragile, of course, but in them, it's extreme. Fragility in narcissists creates a defensive reaction, a closing up and a battening down, which is the opposite of our definition of vulnerable in adult relationships. We don't want to make the mistake of believing that someone who is so fragile is vulnerable in the sense that they could be willing to be open and trusting because that is absolutely not the case here and people can spend years and years waiting for this to happen. And it won't, because part of why narcissists are so fragile is that they cannot be vulnerable in this way. They spend so much energy hiding things and closing doors and keeping secrets from other people and from themselves and deny, deny, denying things that if anyone happens to see or even suspect any of these secret hidden things, it's agonizing for the narcissist. It is a direct hit on that blown glass sculpture. Vulnerability, you ask? Yeah, no thanks. No thank you. As far as narcissists are concerned, the way to combat weakness is not with more weakness, and that's all they see here. To narcissists, intentional vulnerability of any kind is stupidity of the highest caliber. You might as well hang a sign around your neck that says, easy target. Open? Trusting? Have you lost your mind? This is why if you ever do catch them in a truly vulnerable moment, because it does happen, there is usually a punishment coming to you for seeing that. They have to make sure that you understand they're not weak so that you don't think that you can take advantage of them. They also feel deep shame about that and they cannot hold shame or process it in any way so it has to go somewhere. That means it gets dumped on you. The pathologically narcissistic person's entire being is a very fragile structure predicated upon constant fantasy and the systematic denial, deflection, or destruction of anything that threatens to confront or expose said fantasy. To truly and fully understand that is to truly and fully understand why interaction with narcissists is not really possible in any way. You are not even on the same planet as this person, and you never will be. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online over the phone, via text, via messenger, via Skype, and Zoom for clients worldwide. So if you are interested in speaking with me one-on-one -on -one about this or anything else, you can visit littleshaman.org to book an appointment. I teach workshops, clinics, seminars, courses, and classes. So if you're interested in seeing what we're running this month, as I stated earlier, the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Clinic is running this month. You can visit littleshaman.org to do that. I have several books in publication. If you are interested in getting a copy, you can find those on Amazon 
or on littleshaman.org. There are also links to all of these things in the information section of this video. And if you are interested in joining our support group with access to exclusive content, weekly support meetings, and more, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and Transrelational Healing, as well as littleshaman.org, and that's me, the little shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a beautiful day. If you've been struggling through dealing with or recovering from an unhealthy relationship with a narcissist or other toxic personality, The Little Shaman has a catalog of over 500 YouTube videos designed to support your journey from discovery to recovery. You can also find additional resources on the Little Shaman website, including tools, courses, workshops, a support group with weekly meetings, and one-on-one appointments with The Little Shaman that are open to clients worldwide. There's even an AI chatbot built and trained exclusively by the Little Shaman using her work that can answer questions 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. For more information, visit littleshaman.org. You can listen to The Little Shaman wherever you find your favorite podcasts.